Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we return to our study and the conversation that we were having this last week, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction so that we may more properly understand the words of warning and admonition that were given to us by Sister White for this time in Earth's history and for this time within the movement. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we have great need of you. There is much that Sister White had written that has been set aside, that has not been accepted by those within this movement of which I am chief. Father, help us each one, help me to understand these words. Help me to understand more clearly that which is important at this time for me to know. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to join together. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to discuss, to come together, for as you have stated, iron sharpens iron. Help us to be as iron for this time. Help us that this iron <clears throat> may be sharpened by the proper admonitions that we find within your word. We ask, Father, that your angels may attend us. For you have promised that where two or more are gathered there, you will be also. You've also promised that if we ask specifically that these prayers will be granted. Therefore, we ask today, Father, for unity. We ask that we may set aside the things that are keeping us from being unified. That our sins may be forgiven. And we may truly come into this upper room experience so that we may be more prepared to do the work that you would have us to do. We ask also, Father, for your spirit. We have great need for our hearts need to be filled with your spirit and for that to happen. There can be nothing else in our hearts except room for your spirit. Help us now, guide us, we ask, so that we may be made ready for that which you would have done. For this we thank you and this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, last week, we had a very good conversation. We're going to recap a few things, and we're going to go forward with this lesson that Mrs. White had presented for this time. The Lord has declared that if two agree as touching anything and meet to present their petition, they are not alone for he meets with them. It is the prayer offered for some definite purpose that is heard and will be answered. Unity in prayer is honored by God. <clears throat> in unity, there is strength in division weakness. Can we find a greater 
description of the movement today than this sentence? Unity is the element so much needed in the work of God. This drawing apart, this scolding and fretting, this pettish spirit of fault finding might better be out away, might better be cut away, excuse me. For it is a root of bitterness springing up whereby many are defiled. He who is imbued with the love of God will be at unity with his fellow workers. What does this sentence say to each one of us today? Well, one thing is this would be we're not imbued with the love of God. That's pretty direct, isn't it? Yeah, and this thing about the root of bitterness, I mean, it's this harboring of of feelings that really can do so much damage. Yep. Amen. Some, some feeling somebody stepped on our toes somewhere and that's what we focus upon. And, uh, and the fact that it has occurred, I mean, is, is not, um, it's not surprising in a sense with, with human beings, but the message that God has given us, we should be with with the message that God has given us. We should be able to recognize that it's happening in our own hearts, and uh, and follow the counsel that God gives. Unity of thought, <clears throat> unity of prayer, unity of action is essential. Are these not depicting three steps? Thought, prayer, and action. When this unity is manifested, the heavenly intelligences will observe the earnestness of our prayers and our love for one another in the Holy Spirit. It is necessary at times to hold church meetings when the obstinate persistence of a brother must be brought before the church for decision. But what a value is the decision of men who are full of suspicion, of jealousy, and evil surmising? <clears throat> who can put reliance upon the decisions arrived at in board meetings where such a spirit controls the members? <clears throat> Mrs. White is being ex exceedingly clear for us at this time. Because we have seen this occurring, whether we're dealing in the movement or whether we are seeing what's occurring in the church. Who are at this time true soldiers of Christ? Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Ephesians 6, 10, and 11. Do not act <clears throat> as though Christ were not a risen, ascended Savior. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with the truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Ephesians 6, 12 to 16. <clears throat> we are now to yoke up with Christ. Let a bridle be put upon the tongue. Pray for the Holy Spirit. Gird up the loins of your mind. Humble yourselves. Do not exalt self. 
put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. God's true servants stand ready to go wherever providence leads the way. Neither does he call anything which he possesses his own, whether it be talents, learning, position, wealth, or influence. It is the Lord lent treasure. And it is to be employed to strengthen his flock. We are all to be messengers of his mercy, ministers of his grace. Now, the thing about this is that it, it requires faith to trust that God is going to take care of things. Yes. I mean, I mean, I think this is the main problem. I mean, we could define it in different ways. But if we're not connected with Christ, if we don't trust that he is working out his purposes, we sort of step in and think that we can work them out better, that we need to do something. When we need to we need to be connected with him and trust that the things that we don't have control over, he is still guiding. This was the problem in 1863. Mm -hmm. This was the problem in 1886. This was the problem in 1909. This is the problem that continues within the church and the movement today. Well, it was the problem that that, that James faced in himself. I mean, we could see in the 1893 General Conference Bulletin that, you know, he's expecting that the end events are going to come about. And when things don't happen the way that he expects, he, he takes he takes it personally, which is why he ends up so bitter um by you know 1909 i mean it, it's it's kind of hard to to put ourselves in his shoes to some degree but in some ways we can i mean sure. we can see that you know we expected things to happen that didn't happen and and the natural human thing is to sort of blame other people for the failure um, you know, especially since, you know, we believe so hard in this message and we've seen the damage other people have done and, you know, you could take it personally, but, but we aren't to take it personally because this God is in control and we need to trust him. But, it, but it's always the difficult part for me is to know when to act and when not to act. Cause sometimes not acting can just be, the result of cowardice and fear of, of the results if we act. And, but sometimes we need to act. And so knowing that that's, that, that, that's a really difficult one, at least for me personally. <clears throat> Any other thoughts? And thank you, by the way. It takes discipline. I mean, it. you run across these things, and like Theodore says, you don't know what you should be doing. Um, and how do you how do you work around that? I don't. I, there's no answer. I mean, you sometimes you do things and you just look back and see what the results were. Was this a good thing or not? And now, as we're going through this, we're studying judges. And finding out that all of our actions basically were kind of already foreseen. <laughs> and, uh, so what do you do? We look ahead so we can kind of know what we need to do. I mean, that's, that's, didn't she say something about, you know, um, coming together and praying and uh, studying? It, it, right. And, and if we did that on the regular about everything that we did, I think that we'd be much better off, or at least we sometimes slow our roll down just a little bit because we're often so um, hair triggerish 
<laughs> for lack of better words, you know, we, we, something happens and we respond. I mean, because that's what we do is cause and effect, you know. <laughs> well, there is the verse in Ecclesiastes 11, verse 6. In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand. For thou knowest not whether shall prosper, either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. All right. And, and as far as, you know, I mean, part of the thing of studying together. So, I mean, this is where I've had the problem. I mean, because I would much rather be studying um, with the Canadian and American group. Um, and, You're you know, not alone. You're not yeah. alone in that. And, and, you know, and I, I sometimes feel maybe I'm to blame that I'm not there at those studies. But I, I, it's hard for me to go where I'm not welcome. And and it's been very, very made made very clear that I'm not. Um, so you know, so you wonder, well, what what do I do in this situation? But I know when you're not having communication with people, when you're not interacting with people, and it's pretty difficult even on on like social media to really have any kind of relationship. But when you're not, it allows imaginations to take hold. You know, suppositions. We, we think that somebody's doing this or thinking that. Um, and and we don't know, right? And, you know, and I have this situation at work where there's two managers who, when I'm working, they're not there. Uh, or at least very little do our paths ever cross. Um, and I'm always getting in trouble because they imagine things. They just don't know enough about the business or even what I'm doing. Um, so I get in trouble, you know, I got yelled at yesterday on the phone for something that really I shouldn't have ever been yelled at. And I got, you know, uh, confronted by them on a couple of other occasions about things supposedly that I did wrong, which I didn't. But the thing is, you know, something's going on, right? So if I was working with them, though, on a regular basis, I don't think these things would happen. You know, if we're if we're communicating and interacting with people, we get to understand them and know them. And so, you know, part of the problem I feel with the movement is that, you know, we don't really know each other. And that and that's so difficult to deal with, you know, somebody. It's like when you're dealing with somebody on, on Facebook and you're having this argument and you don't even know this person. I mean, you've never you've never worked side by side with them. And and it's difficult enough even when you do. When you when you are interacting with a person, but when you're, but when you all you know is what it is most of you know most of what we know about other people is our own imagination about them in the first place, right? Right. We so, make evil surmisings. Right. <laughs> so you know, so as Christians in in this movement, I mean, our responsibility is to keep those things in check. To, to trust things to God, because God knows, right? He knows the hearts and minds. That's us. right. Amen. And um, so in situations where, you know, the temptation comes to think about somebody in some particular way because of the very limited knowledge I have of what they're thinking and, and what they're doing, um, you know, to have this sort of harsh idea about them and to to hold on to that and and for it to affect my relationship with them. You know, that's the thing that I, I struggle with. You know, am I doing that? You know, is, is this disunity in the movement uh, my fault? Is there a fault on my part that has has aided in what has happened? And and that's what you always have to to do in any situation. I mean, that's why I was up half the night thinking about the situation at work. Like, have I done something to contribute to this? What could I have done differently? Because um, one, none, none of us like conflicts, at least hopefully we don't. Um, so when you have a conflict, I mean, it, it one is people are hurt by it. Um, nothing is benefited by it unless you can resolve a conflict. Because conflicts resolve do bring about unity if you can if you can take the situation that this movement's in right now and if you can have hearts united 
after such division, you have a very powerful unity. Right? If we can be reconciled, that becomes extremely powerful. Much more powerful than if we just got along the whole time. If, if you understand what I'm saying. Uh, I guess an example would be, uh, you know, if you break the neck on a guitar and you repair it, that repair is stronger than the original, uh, than the guitar was originally. Not that I suggest you break necks on guitars and repair them, but, but you understand what I'm saying. So, you know, if, yeah. God, if God can somehow use us, if he can, if he can unite this movement, this movement will be extremely powerful. If, well, yes. When, when, yeah, okay. when, and yeah, yeah. So when God does this, this movement will be powerful. Right. No guessing. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's probably by by looking at the lines and whatever. It's something that we have to go through. So there is a there is a point to it, which maybe we don't see at the minute. But this is where your faith comes in, you know, where we coming together like what we're doing and studying it out and questioning it shows that we're we're trying to move in the right direction. Yeah. So the lines where we see these conflicts, you know, that have occurred in the book of Judges, for instance, and then we're applying them to our our movement. Um, you know, we could look at them. We could say, well, here is God pointing out all of the, the the people who are leaving the movement, all the bad things. And this just confirms that us who are not being, you know, the, the ones who are studying lines, we're somehow in the right. So, you know, it sort of is a justification in some way. I don't know how, how to sort of phrase that. But we can see what God's pointing us to is not further division. He's pointing us to our responsibility in coming into unity with our brethren and how we are to do that. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. I believe that is correct. Yeah, and that's why, you know, I brought up like Joanne's uh, uh, paper. So, you know, I'm just going to be quite honest. Like Joanne and I do not get along with each other. I mean, I've known her since uh, 1988 um, when I moved. Well, actually, I know her since 87. Um because she was a part of the Upper Room Bible Study group after I had moved away and that, that still continued in the attic of my home that I grew up in. And um, she became an Adventist at that time while I was at Silver Hills. And then she moved to, um, to Warburg and started this self-supporting work. And then I was called from, uh, from British Columbia to Alberta to work in this uh, self-supporting work in Alberta. In Warburg, and um, so I've known her for a long, long time, um, and and I know that you know definitely we're in conflict with it, each other at the present time, even though I've tried to, in my mind at least, try to um, communicate. Doesn't seem that it's happening, but I look at the paper that she put out, and I see that here is where the movement should be discussing. I mean. And it's not so much even about these, because it talks about speculation. I mean, we even have to look at how we, we speculate or surmise or hypothesize or suppose or conjecture or theorize, right? All these different synonyms or guess about other people and what's happening. And I mean, part of the reason you come together to study is not so much to sort out the truth, though that is the result, but a lot of it is to sort out other people, if you understand what I mean. Because no, I don't. <laughs> what do you mean? We need to come close together. We need to know each other. Because in knowing the truth, it's not just um, having an intellectual understanding of, of the ideas of the scripture. We have to actually act as Christians. And if if we yeah. If we can come together as Christians to study in the spirit of Christ, Christ can teach us. But if we go there in a spirit of confrontation, of controversy, of conflict, um, God can't show us anything. 
right? If we if we come come there with ideas about others and we come there trying to prove our points, I mean, God is not in that. So, uh, so God is calling us to come together as the disciples did in the world. Well, we're supposed to empty ourselves of self. Um, and how do we, we interpret that? And um, the biggest uh, come away I get with that is, is uh, don't make these presuppositions about people. And when you come together, you know, focus on what the actual issue is that you're there for and not your personal issues with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, those personal issues oftentimes get worked out in the work itself. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I met, meet up with guys all the time. I don't know these people. I did it a couple weeks ago in, in Virginia. I don't know these people. Maybe uh, by name, that's it. But mm -hmm. we have to come together and we have to do a job. Okay? So we get to doing the job. And as we're doing the job, we get to know each other. We still have that job to do. We still focused on it. And when we're done, you know, we're done. And we walk away and we have that experience with these individuals to kind of put in our mental collective uh, to what kind of individuals you're, you're now working with. Mm -hmm. And so maybe the next time you work together, you have a better understanding. And so the, the actual job goes even faster. Mm -hmm. Now, um, yeah. And now, now when you're working with somebody on like a really short term basis, so you're not not with them every day, you're not rubbing shoulders with them every day. I mean, sometimes that can run fairly smoothly. But yeah. if, you, if you're working with people over a long period of time, I mean, there are people that can grade at you. I mean, <laughs> it, I mean, I'm sure that it happens sometimes in, in situations where you just there's some people as soon as you meet them, the personality that they have, the things they say. Those can grate at you. But, you know, if you know it's a short time, you can put up with it. Right. But if it's over a long period of time and there's things, I mean, it could be the person's voice. I mean, it could be their laugh. It could be some of their mannerisms that, you know, can just trigger something in us. Right. Well, we kind of have an example, don't we? With uh, I think it was Barnabas and Paul. Didn't they like separate because they were having... A little bit of personal issues. Well, and well, and that was partly, you know, Paul was not happy with John Mark and Barnabas, you know, looked highly upon John Mark. So whatever exactly the details are of that situation, I don't know. But but yeah, right? they have a controversy with each other and went their separate ways. Right. Um, so, but you know, we have in this movement, we have different personalities. You know, what to one person is of little, little moment is another to another person, person a weight grievous to be born, right? So, you know, mm -hmm. we may take something light that and not realize how much it hurts another person. We don't understand their past experience. And, um, you know, I can be quite, um, for some people, I can, I can seem quite cold depending on their personality. Some people think the opposite. So it's, it's kind of hard to know where, where that comes from. <laughs> But for some people, just, you know, the way that I'm, I'm fairly serious um, and some people aren't as serious. Right. So that and, and that can be people can be intimidated uh, sometimes by, you know, how we speak, the language we use, how much we talk. Sometimes people don't like the person who talks a lot. I tend to talk a lot, you know, so, um, you know, so all these different things. And and they can they can feed into this uh, this picture. Like once we start um, creating a picture of a person, a, a good example of this was um, a pastor we had who had done a, a sermon in a business meeting against me personally and in the twenty five twenty um, as well. Um, I mean, you, you've heard of people gathering up stones, right? Well, he had been my mm -hmm. pastor at that time for three and a half years, and he had a binder full of stones that he had gathered up um, of all of these, uh, all the things that people told him about me, <laughs> you know, I, I was quite surprised. And, 
and I guess what happened is the the conference wanted him to have a meeting with me. So he sat down with Heidi and I and went through uh, this binder of of all the, the accusations that he had heard about me. It, it's quite interesting, um, especially because he told me where all of them came from, which usually often, you know, they'll say, well, people have said this about you, but, you know, you don't get the source. But once you know the source, you can sort of frame it in its, its proper context. You can see how it's either been distorted, um, you know, or uh, um, you can actually see, you know, like that the person receiving that information has distorted it and that the intent, intent is quite different than the person who gave it. Because often, you know, we'll hear about something, you know, this person said this about you. When you go talk to the person, the person is kind of puzzled. And so, well, you know, it never really happened like that. That's not what I meant. Um, and and you can tell that the person is being sincerely honest. It's the person who received the message who has distorted that, that message. And, and that's kind of what I saw with the pastor is he had actually taken all these statements. He started to have a color of what he thought I was, and he just kept filling that in. So every everything that was said to him, he he colored with that brush. So so we have to be careful about this. This is something that you know, you know, I've thought a lot about. You know, not just recently, but you know, throughout my lifetime. And you know, if this movement, you know, I use the word if there, but I mean it in the sense if this movement is going to move forward, it's only going to move forward when. We actually take this counsel that Ellen White has given. It can't move forward in any other way. The uh, just on on the point of of people, you know, you were saying sometimes just the way people talk and the way they appear. Uh, to be truthful, when when me and Phyllis came to the movement, uh, Jeff Pippinger, our our thinking on Jeff was very hard to listen to. He's very this, he's very that. But, you know, I said, but what he's saying is the truth and whatever. And as it, as as we watched the videos over time and we seen his character revealed, it totally changed our perspective of him to the point where he just felt like a very close friend. But it shows you the way you can misunderstand people or you make impressions initially that are not there. And like you say, it's very hard to sort of judge people remotely. But uh, when you understand the message and you see the message is correct and, and you look past that, then you see the pressures they're under and whatever, and you come to understand that, hold on, you know, these are just people like us. Yeah, I, re I remember. This is kind of fun. Um, so when I first started writing, watching Jeff's videos, because um, because I'd met Jeff first. I mean, I'd met him at in Oklahoma, but uh, um, you know, but I was not really listening to the messages too much because it was just overwhelming for me. And I was doing all the special musics before every meeting, so I was exhausted. Um, but but anyway, um, so when you know when I got home, I started watching these videos, and a lot of the videos he had that were online at that time, Jeff used to have this headset with this mic right in front of his mouth. I don't know if people remember that, those videos. I do. But you would have that heavy breathing and it sort of sounded like he was angry the whole time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. You got this impression by listening to these. Um, and some of them, you know, were not even videos. Some were just like recorded messages that I was listening to. Um, you know, that, that you got quite a different impression of of who Jeff was in, until you, you know, spent time with him. But still, a lot of people had a hard time with him, um, you know, not just because of that, you know, just his his personality. It, it can come across in certain situations as rather harsh. And, and he had a pretty rough upbringing, right? So, I mean, his dad was a pretty hard character. And so... Um, you know, you can easily find fault with human personalities, but it doesn't really have much to do with whether that person's following God or not. You know, it's 
you know, if a person has truth, he has truth. He may not be refined, you know, in the way that we would expect a person to be refined. But sometimes what we considered refined, you know, is, it, it, you know it can vary, right? Uh, depending on our upbringing and our culture. Um, so, so this is, I mean, these are part of the conflicts that occur. And the question is, are we going to allow these things to hinder us in receiving the truth? That's the point that I was making. You know, if we had have went on first impressions on Jeff, we wouldn't be where we are today and wouldn't yeah. have studied through the message and understood. And you would have took information that was fed on him from third parties, like in our church, so there's 2520 and there's nothing in it. And that's all, you know, you had to put that aside. You had to look at the truth. And in doing that, you came together on points of that. And then as you went on, as Ron was saying, you developed a relationship, albeit over over the internet and stuff like we all are doing at the minute. Mm -hmm. uh, that 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 when people would say things against them, you would say, no, if you listen to what they say or if you listen to what they've done or whatever, the truth comes out. And I think that's where we all have this ability of trying to separate the message from character assassination as such. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly the point. Well, he uses messengers and sometimes messengers are a little rough. I mean, um, Luther, for instance, uh, I read all of his works. I mean, to me, uh, I've seen a lot of the truth, but he was a slight bit of a bigot, um, a slight? drinker. <laughs> I knew I'd probably get caught up on that one. <laughs> um, but, you know, the character traits don't detract from the truth that you learn from him. I mean, I... I, I, I yeah, I can sit there and judge the guy and then go, yeah, that all that stuff that he said is just out the window because of the guy who, who, he, who he is. Um, but no, um, you, you actually have to toss all that stuff out and get to the truth and then and then test the truth. You, you know, because uh, when you start telling the truths, you can actually test these things. Um, as we start to get science or the data in, the data is given us things that we can actually test and so we start testing them we've been given certain um um analytical tools that we're able to test that we didn't have before luther never had them uh, or he might have had a little bit of a grasp to them but you know you could not reflect anything that we've learned today as to the stuff that he was teaching before you know he was just teaching uh, the lines of information and how contradictory it was with the um, the universal church at the time. Even though he was a bigot and, a, and you know, a drunkard, maybe not a drunkard, but, you know, heavy beer drinker. <laughs> you know, I mean, it doesn't detract from the truth. One of the comments that has come in the chat that we need to we need to very carefully consider is that Sister White tells us that in conflict, character is developed. Correct. Now, we are all given tests. What is the purpose of a test? Well, a test there. there there are tests that are meant to, to examine whether we've learned the lessons correctly or not. Right. Uh, there are tests that are more like trials. They're, they're meant to, uh, to strengthen us, to show us our weaknesses so that we can uh, develop, right? So there are basically two types of tests. And, and often tests in the Bible are more like trials. They're not the final exam. Uh, there are situations that God puts us in so that we can we can recognize our weaknesses and then and go to him for uh, correction. How often do we praise God when we're in a test and we know that we failed the test? I 
How often do we praise God when when we have failed that test, we have had something revealed to us that needs to be corrected in our own lives? I think we should always praise God for that. Right, but how often do we do it? I, th I think I do it all the time. Okay. <clears throat> Speaking for myself, there are times that I have to wonder, and then I look, and I, I praise God for revealing to me the things that need to change in my life in order to draw closer to him. Yeah, I, I think in the first part of the Christian walk, we expect to, you know, when we first become a Christian, to go from victory unto victory. Um, and of course, we don't find that happening. But we should learn early on that everything that comes to us comes from God and that we're put in that situation for a reason. And that reason is mostly for us. I mean, secondarily, I guess, for those around us. Um, so, you know, when I have the conflicts at work like I had yesterday, I'm thankful for it. One is I'm hoping that it will bring about more unity at work. Right. That's why you know, I rack in my mind, what is it that I'm supposed to do in this situation? You know, I could take this and sort of mourn the fact that this is happening and, and worry about my job and start, you know, planning. OK, I guess I've lost my job and, you know, they're, they're, they're obviously out to fire me and, and I, I could be angry about it and bitter about it and all those types of things. But, you know, we need to see that these things happen for a reason and that we can trust that God knows these things. And that good can come from it. However, that's going to come about. I mean, the good coming about may be me losing my job. But, you know, whatever comes about is, is seen by God beforehand. And, and I'm also always considering how I can witness. So those people that, you know, I work with, I mean, they're not Christians really in, the, in any true sense. I'm not sure where they stand as far as what they think about themselves. But, um, you know, they don't they don't manifest anything that I would call uh, Christianity. Um, but, you know, so I think about every person that I have a conflict with, I look at it as an opportunity of, to reveal Christ's character. And so, you know, in that situation, in the conversation, I revealed Christ's character, at least I believe I did, and how I interacted with them when they were screaming at me but also in dealing with the customer that uh, they thought was so upset, I was able to diffuse any of this sort of anger. And the customer was very happy with me after I talked to him on the phone. So, you know, as Christians, we need to always see every conflict as an opportunity. That is what we should see it as is the great controversy in action on the field where we are the soldier in this battle. And that we have the opportunity to overcome things within ourselves and, and to be, um, uh, be able to help those around us see their situation and, and that they might be saved. And that's, that's how we look at life. So um, Angela, I believe, it was put up a good thing in the chats on uh, Second Corinthians 10, verse 7, 10, and 12, which deal with what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. It says, do we look at things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. And so verse 10 goes, for his letters say... They are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. And then four, we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some of the commended, some that commended themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. It's Thank you, Angela. You know, so the question that I have, yeah, thank you for that. And um, so the question that I have is, you know, I, I've still been contemplating on how to address what I what I feel a strong conviction of is that we we need to make some kind of invitation. 
Um, now, when I when I look at Joanne's paper, I mean, I've thought about this, I've prayed about it, what what we should do. But the one thing I would want to do is to invite Joanne to present next Sabbath and to discuss the paper with her, whether that's going to create more problems or whether that's going to be beneficial, I don't know. But that's that's the feeling that I have to invite her to present. Um, and I guess it, it would be up to her what she does with that. Well, her her message was very timely. Mm -hmm. um, we, <laughs> I think, um, was it us that were was talking amongst ourselves about the um, about not guessing at stuff? We needed to be more sure of things. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and 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 the, the I think it was the week later this thing shows up, mm -hmm. this this um uh, one that uh, Joanne had prepared. Yeah. Uh, so it these things be, are it needs to be not our timing. <laughs> They're yeah, definitely not our timing. And it needs to be understood correctly in the sense that, um, you know, we need to we need to look at what Ellen White says. And we need to understand it as a group because it is something that that definitely, if we end up on the wrong side of the understanding of this, I mean, it would undermine not just this message, but it would undermine the Adventism, right? Even though it comes from the spirit of prophecy, if you if we take if we take this in the wrong way, um, we would just abandon. Adventism, time prophecy, and, and everything. So I, I don't, I mean, I don't think that that's where Joanne's going with this. I mean, I, I see it, from my perspective, it's sort of an attack upon what Colin was doing. But it is, but it is also indirectly can be considered an attack upon this, this movement altogether. Um, but yet we know that this is the truth, what Ellen White is saying. And, and, and so we need to, we need to look at this and and my preference would be to have joanne present this again and then so i want people to consider that because i have to decide whether i'm going to ask her to do that or not um and and whether that would be beneficial i mean because the one thing i don't want to do is end up with something being a conflict well but, but, you know i feel impressed in that direction as as much as you know my human nature uh sort of recoils at that does that make sense? Mm. You know. <laughs> you seen what uh, Iran wrote? Yeah. So, you know, and, and of course, it, I, I don't see how you can present messages and not record them. Because the, to me, that becomes things that are done in secret. And, and I, I don't believe. That's the opinion I have, too. Yeah, everything should be done openly. Uh, we yeah, should be and be able to be weighed. And when somebody says something that you know their words are are having some effect, so you know, um, the recording of it is it's not a big deal for as far as I'm concerned. I mean that yeah. that's weight that you can go back and go, oh well, oh I misspoke there, or well, you know. See, some some people don't want things put on the internet because they don't want to be identified. Um, yeah. I'm not sure, you know, if this is the case, with, with, you know, why everybody is wanting things recorded or not. I don't know, but like I know a guy who um, he doesn't want to have his name and his picture ever together on the internet anywhere, you know. But of course. They are together on his driver's license. Right. <laughs> um, you know, the government knows everything, um, you know, about us, right? And, and corporations know more about us than, uh, you know, friends do. Um, so, you know, to, for the Christian to be fearful that somehow the government is watching, um, I, I just don't understand it. I mean, 
we we have Christ watching over us. We have angels around us. But right. I don't think that's the case in, in, in this matter. And and it's just again, it's a conjecture or a supposition. All you can do is offer a person an opportunity. Uh, right. to, I mean, I, I wouldn't have somebody present unless I can record them. Um because if I can't record them, then I don't have a record of that, and and uh, you know then I can't I can't review it. I can't see whether what they what they said uh, is is accurate or not, or what I think they said. And you know, and it's often difficult because you have a conversation with somebody sometimes, let's say on the phone, and you hear about the things that you supposedly said to them. Um, you know, and even sometimes having a conversation with a person and. Um, you know, somebody says you said such and such. It'd be nice if you just had a, you know, a recording of every conversation. You could look back and see what you said or how they took something wrong. <laughs> but, you know, I had this situation arise with Colin where, you know, I supposedly said some things, which he called me out on on a video. Um, and so I, I watched his video and I went back and I looked at, at what I had said and I could see where he misunderstood me. So then I could phone him up and clarify what I was actually saying because I didn't even understand what he was talking about in his accusation. Um, there definitely wasn't any thought that had ever gone through my mind. So, so we know how prone to, to error human nature is. We know how imperfect language is. We know how... And, and scientists now know a lot more about how little we actually listen to whatever people are saying. Um, we think we listen to a lot more than we do. Um, so it takes time. But God's Holy Spirit can unite hearts that would not have been united in any other way. Mm. And that's because we become united with Christ. And that, that's the fellowship of his sufferings. That's the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And, and that's what we should be seeking for. Is all the talk about righteousness by faith or talk about the lines or talk about the Sunday law or whatever things we want to talk about it as Seventh-day Adventists are meaningless if we can't be in unity with our brethren. If we can't be in unity with those that are seeking to follow Christ, then there's something wrong with us and we need to be corrected. So the question is, how are we going to do that? Um, you know, whether it's, it's something that's going to happen next Sabbath or whether it's just an invitation that's made then or whatever, but you know, it's something we have to, to consider because this movement needs to figure out a way to come together to study So that the things that God is showing us uh, can have their effect on everyone, that everyone can benefit from the light that God has been giving us. So it's, it's something to consider. Okay. Yeah, I, not only that, I, I don't think people should be taking down videos. You know, say, for instance, you know, you, you have preached several sermons and then they come to a disagreement. So they go back in history and just erase your whole whole system uh, you know that doesn't give anybody an opportunity to review and have a look at, at what's happening and that should be open to uh once you the vast you are you allowed to be recorded then that should be kept just because somebody doesn't know yeah you know what this reminded me of when they did that was um you know the excuse was if we have it on our website then we're sort of endorsing it and of course, all you need to do is just write a little caveat at the, you know, where the video is posted. Um, you know, but but this is kind of the position the church has taken with us, correct? It's also correct. The, it, it's also the position that occurred with those that were in charge of FFA at the end. Yes. Yeah. Because uh, I I fortunately got a, a recording of everything that we had did. Prior to to that date, and if we didn't have that access to all that was gone. Well, I found it. I you know I still find it very interesting that prior to July 18th, that they were making many hard drives 
with a lot of presentations. And a lot of those presentations have now been summarily, perfunctorily removed from the FFA website, or they have been severely edited. Yeah, that, that's the point I was making because uh, we were fortunate enough to get one through before that happened. Yep. And then if anybody was asking questions, you could look through it and get that information and send it to them. Whereas by going by FFA, you, you couldn't do that anymore. Which was sad. Yeah, I that's happened to a lot of sites. Yeah, it was a mistake to take down, you know, Tess's and Parminder's videos and, and other people's videos as the movement moved ahead. Well, I'm I'm speaking primarily of Elder Jeff's presentations. Yeah, well, there's that, but I just think anybody's presentations, right? You know, because it's part of a of, of a record. It's you called know? history, right? Yeah, and and you know, if we had done that in Adventism, if we had somehow had the ability to go through and delete Samuel Snow's uh, midnight cry message because he ended up in apostasy, um, or as some would would choose to delete the 1843 and the 1850 charts. Yeah. Mm. Right, so- Well, they've so tried. Or rewrite the, the Ellen White Great Controversy even. Exactly. Mm. Yeah, so, you know, so the, you know, the point here is that, you know, we, we don't want to do to others what has been done to us. Right. Mm. And so, All and right. So, that kind of ties the hand behind your back for sure. I mean, we're we're actually um, we have we answer to a higher authority. <laughs> okay, go ahead. okay, God calls upon His people to be converted, to become humble as a little child, that they may have childlike faith. Those who have grown hard and cold and unimpressible may have the form of godliness, but they have lost the virtue that keeps the mind humble. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 3. Remove from the heart that criticizing spirit. These next three words are important. God hates it. God hates the criticizing spirit. Those who yield to this spirit have given themselves up to do Satan's work, and he stands by exulting. Is there any greater warning that is now given to this movement of the need for unity, of the need of coming together, than the depiction that by using a criticizing spirit, by holding on to such a spirit, that we are giving ourselves up to do Satan's work. We need to be considering this. We need to keep this in our minds. We need to give less to the adversary and more to Christ. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. Matthew 18.10 They may be ignorant. They may not have had the opportunities that you have had. They have a fierce enemy to contend against, and in their feeble strength, they may err. They need your tender sympathy and compassion. Even though they make mistakes in the work given them, they may be doing their best. As a servant of Christ, you are to watch for souls as one that must give an account. Are you yoked up with the Redeemer? Are you cooperating with him? Are you obeying the words, go work today in my vineyard? Matthew 21, 28. 
Are you doing the best to represent the Lord by manifesting tender sympathy and love for those Jesus has bought with his own blood? Or is your conscience so blinded that it does not lead you to work as Christ worked? How much more specific could she have been? I mean, brothers and sisters, these words were written in 1898. So we're talking that these words were written 124 years ago. Christ says to us, take heed that you despise not one of these little ones who need your tenderest watch care, who believe on me, but who need to learn each day how to serve me, how to pray, how to obey the word of God. Any offense given them is regarded as though given to me. Take heed. Listen. Do we in any way wish to be throwing stones at Christ? Do we in any way wish to crucify him anew? Shall we heed the, cha the charge? For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Matthew 18, 10, 11, and 14. Will those who claim to be children of God Take heed, Matthew 18, 10. Will they reveal the tender love and compassion revealed by Christ? Or will they be heedless and unkind, careless of the example set before the youth and those <clears throat> newly come to the Father? If we are laborers with Christ, we shall work just as Christ worked. Our say and our dispositions are not to be grafted into the work. If we have not the spirit of Christ, we are none of his. Profession is nothing. By their fruits, ye shall know them. Are we holding on to this? Are we accepting this into our day-to-day -day lives? More intense interest is to be manifested for the souls perishing out of Christ. All who work for these souls must put on Christ. He says, without me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5. Christ tells all who claim to believe in him, that the work they are to do is represented by the shepherd searching for the lost sheep. All our interest, our love, and our compassion is to be exercised in seeking for the lost sheep. There is to be no neglect in this work. Of the shepherd, Christ says, doth he not leave the ninety and nine? and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so, be that he find it. Verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth rejoice more over that sheep than over the ninety and nine that went not astray. Matthew eighteen twelve to 13. What other things can we take from what we've just read? What other things are there that we can apply as we continue to seek the Lord so that we may truly be unified?
This next document, Manuscript 146 of 1899, was written on October 7th of 1899. If we reverse the date, here we could have the 10th day of the seventh month, but it was written on the seventh day of the 10th month. On the seventh day of the 10th month, we would have the Feast of Trumpets. It would be that we would be being called together for an holy convocation to prepare our hearts for that which is to come on the Day of Atonement. Are our hearts today so prepared for the day of atonement that is soon to close. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I find it interesting that this was previously unpublished, not in anything, not in a manuscript release, not in any other publication. And one or more typed copies of this document contain additional Ellen White handwritten interlineations, which may be viewed at the main office of the Ellen G. White estate. So we are dealing with a document that has not been fully released. The question was asked of Christ. What is a man profited if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16, 26. Man sells himself cheaply when he spends his life in securing worldly advantages. For in the ambition to secure earthly estate, business occupies the mind. And God is forgotten that man reaps loss to all eternity. His money and lands cannot pay a ransom for his soul. Better, far better, are shattered hopes and the world's denunciation with the approval of God than to sit with princes and forfeit heaven. Christ declares, you cannot serve God and mammon. Matthew 6, 24. We cannot serve God and money. Addressing the churches through the disciple John, Christ said, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And then, how is this followed up? when we are given the admonition to hear what is being said. Sister White continues, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with isav, that thou mayest see. What is the gold tried in the fire? How can we identify this? 
How should we identify it? We were just actually talking about it a little while ago. Um, it's the confrontations that we go through um, that makes us better characters. As long as we, you know, hold fast to God's word. How else could we identify that, brother? Hmm. Not sure. Okay, I'm, I'm going to I don't want to have what you're in mind. <laughs> what do you have in mind? I, I'm going to submit something for all of us to consider. What is the Old English spelling of the word gold? Gould, G-O-U-L-D, I think it was. It's Do the same as uh, Ellen's last name used to be. Her, her maiden, maiden name. name, was it not? Yeah. No, it's just her middle name. Is it her middle name? Har Harmon's her maiden name. Okay. Oh, that's right. You're right. Okay, so Ellen Gould Harmon White was not and have not the writings of Sister White and the Old and New Testament, both been gold tried in the fire? Well, yeah. Yeah. So when we are being given this, that he is counseling us to buy of Christ, the gold, the gold tried in the fire, can we then afford to set aside anything that, is written in scripture or in the spirit of prophecy? When we run into churches today that have access to the spirit of prophecy and they choose that it's okay to use for private devotion, but it should not be used in daily practice. Is that not rejecting the gold tried in the fire? Are they then rejecting becoming rich according to God's standard? And what of the white raiment? Here is Sister White. But what white raiment is being applied here? Is this not the very character of Christ himself? Is this not the wedding garment that we are to have if we are to be admitted to the wedding feast? Yes, to all of those questions. We are to have this on so that we may be clothed according to what is important in God's eyes and that we will not have the shame of our nakedness appearing. The shame that we are trying to stand in our own character. That which is as filthy rags. And we are told to anoint, anoint our eyes with eye salve that we may truly see. How many times do we read something? Are we studying something that we really don't understand. These studies through Joshua and Judges have been as the eye salve to open our eyes to where we stand right now. And I, I see the eye salve as showing us its spiritual insight into our own condition. I would agree, but it's also that we need to pay attention to that which we are 
currently studying because how much light has come through these studies through Joshua and Judges? Um, how many, uh, loads and loads. In the last several months, have we not seen a greater yet greater revelation for our characters in the way that that these books have been opened i would say yes the admonition that is given from this book from revelation to the seventh church has been directed as much to us as it has been directed to the church itself. We, yes. are, being, we are being told that he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. This is repeated throughout the warnings to these churches, to all seven churches. We are to make diligent work for eternity. Those to whom the Lord has entrusted the talent of means, he expects to return to him their gifts and offerings. They are to act in behalf of Christ, representing the character of the great gift which God gave to save a sinful world. In entrusting means to human beings, he designs that they shall not be consumers, but producers. Christ bridged the gulf that sin had made. And thus he showed how highly he estimates the human race. He clothes his divinity with humanity, that humanity might take hold of divinity, and man become a partaker of the divine nature. Is this not ultimately the message of righteousness by faith? And having done so much, he did not leave his work unfinished. He was known on earth as the friend of sinners. He mingled with all classes of society that he might become acquainted with God manifest in the flesh. He did not shun the social life of his countrymen. At the very opening of his ministry, he attended a marriage feast in Cana. Death and hell were conquered by his presence. He healed disease. He rebuked injustice and oppression and preached the gospel to the poor. In the wilderness of temptation, he met the enemy and conquered him with a thus saith the Lord. Get thee hence, Satan, he said. It is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Matthew 4.10 How great was this gift to man, and how like our God to make it, with a liberality that can never be exceeded. He gave that he might save the rebellious sons of men and bring them to see his object and discern his love. Will you, by your princely offering, show that you think nothing too good to give to him who gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life? John 3, 16. God has honored man in making him a laborer together with Christ. Yet how many are despising the message of mercy coming to them from God? There is nothing in all the world so great consequence to Christ as his purchased possession, his church, his workers who go forth 
to scatter the seeds of truth, looking forward to the harvest. None but Christ can measure the solicitude of his servants as they seek to save that which is lost. And he imparts his spirit as the self-sacrificing worker with earnest, untiring efforts, labors to win souls from sin to righteousness. A Paul may plant and Apollos water, for this is his work. But it is God alone who can give the increase. Brothers and sisters, how are we to view what Mrs. White is saying here? How are we to accept this within our own lives? How can we go forward if we are not being led by his spirit? We have been told specifically that God hates the criticizing attitude. When we are doing nothing but finding fault, are we not standing then with the adversary tearing down the work of Christ? And what does that say of us? When Christ's ambassadors present the gospel in its simplicity and the hearers respond to the word presented, <clears throat> nothing is so gratifying to the heart of infinite love than for these souls to come to him confessing their sins and giving, expressing to their faith and to be truth and to the truth, for he delights to impart to them his righteousness. When the question comes from the anxious soul, what shall I do to be saved? The answer returns, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you, thou shalt be saved. See Acts 16, 30 and 31. Angels rejoice to see hearts open to receive the communication of light and love and pardon. When thanksgiving arises from human hearts because souls are receiving the impress of Christ, <clears throat> heavenly beings take up the song of praise. The prophet Zephaniah writes, In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion, let not thine hand be slack. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty, and he will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Zephaniah 3, 16 and 17. As has been our purpose, we are examining this from the book of Zephaniah. We have been seeing how these words of this prophet before Christ's advent were linked with the actions of the disciples after his return to heaven. God does not change. We have choices to make. Choose this, choose ye this day whom ye will serve. Is the admonition along with the question that is now before you? Who are you going to choose? Will you choose the great apostate? 
or will we choose the first of all creation? Under whose banner do we seek to stand? The banner of one that is ready to criticize, to find fault, to cast out. The one that is willing to hurt the little ones. Or the one that is calling all to him. What say you now? Where do you seek to stand? Any further comments or questions with, regarding what we have been addressing today? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Took took me a minute to get situated here. Um, we did bring up that invitation again. And so I'd like to I'd like to kind of go over it for okay. just a minute. How's the Um so One of the things that sticks out in my mind is something that, that Bonnie had said. Um, you know, how these things are a lot of, you know, it's a lot of study. It is. It's a lot of study. And um, it's hard to, to decompress this message that we've been studying uh, into something that can be presented in an hour. <laughs> Um, it, it'd be very difficult uh, to do. I'm just wondering if, if we should be focusing on, on something like that is to be able to try to a little bit more palatable, not necessarily um, tasty or anything, but um, a lot more um, bottom lines and a lot less of how we got there but referring back to those studies um like in a manner like jeff used to do jeff used to say it's on the public record um and sometimes he would even go as far as uh, defining where that public record was and um i don't we haven't tried any of that at this point um, because we're really not doing too much contact with them. I mean, I, I go to the, the churches, but I have a tendency of not saying too much during those services. And then when we go into the, uh, uh, like the more free form, um, like at the after church, um, get together in a sense, you know, after the presentation, you know, you go down to lunch or buffet or whatever you want to call it and, and do the potluck that's it we go down a potluck and you you have your conversations it's kind of like that but there's no food other than the spiritual food that we're talking about so i mean i don't see these things that we're learning presented in any great in um way that they can even would even comprehend it because we're not we're not the message isn't going to them at this point i mean it's not really going through me I'm trying to, uh, I'm not necessarily avoid, but I've told them straight out, you know, it's, it's hard for me to give you the data um, without you being encompassed in the studies because you will, you know, you'll probably not like some of the things that might be said from us or from this particular study coming out of my mouth. Because <laughs> yeah, I do yeah. have a tendency of screwing things up. Excuse my way of speaking. So, so Ron, um, like it, the thing that needs to be presented. I mean, there's a number of things, but as far as the lines themselves, it, it is not that difficult to show um, that that our line is a zoom into, and that 
that time exists within our line, that we measure time in our line. Um, it's, not, it's not really too hard to show that. I, I think even convincingly, because in our study of understanding the lines, the things that we saw is that we could do this in other histories that we already accept. We could do this with Abraham. Abraham has a line. Mm -hmm. Isaac has a line. Jacob has a line. Joseph has a line. But they're all part of a bigger line of Abraham, Isaac, Jose, Jacob, and Joseph. The first, second, third, and then the fourth angel's message. So in some ways, you know, there's lots of different ways that things can be presented. I mean, there's, you know, whether it's music theory or whether it's Bible study, if somebody understands something, he should be able to present it in, on different levels. The problem, of course, that we face is that there is a, a bias or a resistance, at least, to, to hearing certain things. And, and those are hard things to, to overcome. I mean, it has to happen within the person's heart themselves. I mean, no matter how much you present something that is true, even if, you even if Christ was to present it, if there is a, a closed heart, nothing will gain entrance. And so, you know, the message that somehow... It has to come with us first. There has to be some change in us and, and a work of God on, on, on the hearts of others, which I believe God is doing. I mean, these lines are not just, I mean, they're for all of us. Do you remember and this uh, the exchange well. that went on between um, you, another individual, and I kind of chi I chimed in on it. We were having trouble with a young gentleman that was up in Maine was interrupting and doing a lot of things <laughs> I told you to, to uh, I, I don't recall the gentleman's name but I, I do recall in, in 2020 right after July 18 yes this was pretty much right after that yeah and I was just trying to end off a meeting and he wouldn't let me talk right so and I, I just said to, I said something that I shouldn't have said oh yeah I mean, I did say, you know, just turn them off, you know, or uh, mute them. That's what I said. I, mute them. And I said it kind of loud. And, and now today, um, uh, I feel myself might have made a serious mistake when I did that. Well, yeah. And because it does come, how you treat others will come back uh, upon you. Right. Right. So, Yeah. Yeah, and that situation was was kind of difficult because, you know, I mean, he was not letting anybody even talk. And and we had talked for a while and, you know, I had to end the meeting. But, but you know, I mean, that he, he's not really talked to me since. I mean, he's attacked me a few times on Facebook. But, um, you know, and unfortunately, even if somebody does treat you poorly or, or you perceive that they treat you poorly, you still have to act differently towards that just because right. somebody, i don't have any feelings over you know what's happened in these meetings um i just know that i'm not welcome i can't participate and i've hemmed and hawed over whether i should just watch because i did that for a while just kind of watched um but that was difficult as well right because you know you, i said the odd thing here and there but the thing was just going in such a different direction than, than I was interested in. And I had lots of other things to do. So, you know, so it, it's, you know, we've all done things that are wrong, right? We've, we've not all acted. I mean, we have not. Acted. I mean, I can say this myself. I haven't acted the way that I should in many of these situations. And now I've apologized. But that apology is accepted. I mean, I, I know it's a true apology because I know how I feel. But people aren't always going to accept that apology. So, so in order for, for God to do his work, it has to be God that does this work. The question is, what are we supposed to do? Right? What is, what is the plan of action? And that we're Yes. Supposed. So, you know, yes. I, I personally want to invite Joanne to speak. I think it's a wonderful idea. Yeah. But I don't know if I should be the one inviting everyone, 
right? I, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not really sure how to go about it. I can invite her. People read my emails or not. I well, I can invite her. I can go to the church and I can invite her personally. Well, I mean, she she shows up at the church all the time. Yeah, at the, you mean the well, this Canadian, it's the American group this week, and she would be there. You're saying? Well, I mean, I see her name on the yeah in in the you know the the, the attendance. Yeah, I mean, I I would phone her myself and talk, talk to her, but. Uh... You know, I wouldn't need somebody else, but I'm just talking about all the other people. I mean, I think we have to make invitations to those that we know. Um, I don't know. I mean, I know that Dwight talked to Toby. We haven't heard back as whether he wants to speak or not. Have you? I'll make it. I'll make it somewhat more clear. <clears throat> when I spoke with Brother Toby with all that he's been through in the last several months, yeah. I think it's best that we let him get more settled okay. before we are asking for him to give a presentation. Okay. okay. Now, as far as um, uh, who else, I mean, what about Brother Dan? Would he want to speak? Could we invite him to speak next week? Brother Daniel? Yeah. Is that what you said, Brother Daniel Fontenot? Yeah. Fontenot. Fontenot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, I just either don't... of those, either of those people that have been making presentations, it would be great. But I'm not sure how they're going to take it. You know, do you, <laughs> what do you want to do? Well, we want to dissect this and, and talk about it. I think we want to dissect it. I think we want to listen to what they have to say, and we want to have a discussion. Yeah, well, that's not what they're going to think. <laughs> well, you know, we, can't, we can't go on what we suppose to think, right? True, true. So, anyway, that that's my thoughts. I still haven't decided what I'm doing. Okay. One comment from the chat. As laborers with Christ in his vineyard, which work are we supposed to do? Should we go back to them, the SDA church, to teach them September 11, 2001? How are we to be active laborers? I would, I'm going to give an opinion based upon some of the things that we've recently been studying. Take it for what it's worth. The message I believe that we're going to be showing with those that remain in the church is going to be more that we're going to need to understand how to truly present the 2300 days and specifically the 490 years that were allotted unto the children of Daniel, the children of of God, his people. Yeah, because when we can show the prophecies that Adventists accept, when we can show them the light that has come, that can open up a door for them to look at other things. Right. So no, there's, there's quite a... How do you make that presentation, though? Well, we do we just... We don't just necessarily go back to them. Uh, but uh, like Jeff did, you know, he's got all these presentations out on the Internet and um, he directed them towards Seventh-day Adventist. That's about the only way I can see it, because you're not going to get this warm invitation into a church not to, to a present church. these no. messages. This is an individual work that we do with people that we know that we have contact. Right. Right? That, that makes more sense. I, I, you know, one of the things that, that we always make the mistake of doing is thinking that it's some big work that needs to be done. <laughs> Labor that yeah. we do for individuals can have a far more reaching impact than sermons preached before thousands of people. We are given an example within the Gospels. Was it not Philip that called Nathaniel? Mm-hmm. 
And how did he do it? He went to him and told him. He went to him one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. So we're given this example. How did, how were each of these, of the disciples called with one exception? Mostly individually, family yeah. orientations, that type of stuff. Right. And the only difference is one chose to come to Christ seeking to become a disciple. Yeah, no. yeah we're talking about Judas. Yes, we are. Yeah. So with us... We are to go individually, one-on-one, -on -one, with those that we know, to give these presentations. If we believe that we need to be speaking before the church in all these things, we're going to find that the doors are not just going to be shut. They're going to be slammed. Um, also Agreeable. <laughs> Yeah. Also, in the fact of the invitation going to the American and Canadian group, uh, although you're going there as an individual, the invitation is being made as a group. In other words, the group is asking them to come to do a presentation. So right. it's not a Theodore, Ron Knight, Dwight, Tom Thompson thing. It's it's the group have have been studying and whatever, and they've come to the conclusion, we'd like to understand or invite you to make a presentation to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I agree. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Does everybody else agree? Well, I don't see mm -hmm. that. What? Okay. All right. So shall we then close this meeting with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we see even more clearly our great need of you. We ask, Father, for your guidance, your direction, and your blessing on this Sabbath day. Help us that we may make the decisions that you would have us to make, that these decisions will lead us to follow you more closely to be guided by your spirit, to do the work that you would have us to do. Be with us each one through this day. Direct us in that which we study, in that which we do, so that you may be more glorified, that your character may be lifted up, and that others will come to know you as we are coming to know you. Be with us, we ask. Direct us, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen.